Hello and welcome to The Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samuel. With me today, of course, is co-founder of The Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. So, Peter, um, the other day, um, uh, notable, uh, well-known um, uh, scholar, Richard Sakwa, who um, had written a very good book about um, Ukraine and in particular Maidan and the subsequent uh, course of events in Maidan, um, wrote a long article about um, you know well, the, the the origins of the uh, the current uh, the origins world. of the origins it was the that origins one. of the origins exactly and he framed it in a very odd way he framed mm -hmm. it as a conflict between two rival world visions and as you read you know you're expecting oh yes well on the one side we've got the liberal world vision blah blah you know yes you know, freedom democracy liberal order blah 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 on the other hand is a sort of nationalist uh civilizational identitarian you know uh prime primordial view, uh, view of the world but he doesn't quite do that he kind of presents it as in a sense two you know, liberal world orders uh, in a vision. You had the vision of the um, powers that took themselves to be the victors of uh, the Cold War, which are namely the Western powers. And on the other side, you had uh, Russia, to, to, to a lesser extent China, but Russia was the leader of this uh, alternative bloc um, that obviously did not see itself as a loser in the uh, Cold War, but did not believe that the international order should be organized according to the diktats of this other order. So, but, it was, but nonetheless, it was still a, a view of the world which was not absolutely violative what we what we understand as a liberal world order. So I'll just show you. Yeah, if, if I could, before we before we jump in here, is that it's something I want to uh, accent because George and I have talked about this many, many times, and it kind of puts into context Sakwa's article. And I'm a big fan of Sakwa generally, not this article, but generally I like his work, is that particularly Russia doesn't see that the, the Cold War was um, uh, adequately in, uh, adjudicated to an end. See, th mm -hmm. this is this is a huge... Right. Into, um, uh, interpretation conflict here. The Russians don't believe that it was adequately, um, um, the outcome was adequately defined, okay? Right. And, and right. I think that George and I'll talk about this more as we review his yes, article. That's right. So let me then look at it. And here you can see the, um, the title, which is The March of Folly Resumed Russia, Ukraine, and uh, the West, and here he sets out this uh, framework, um, the two peace systems uh, were on offer when the Cold War ended. The first one was that of the United States. The, f the first is the one that the United States, Soviet Union, China, and other victors helped constitute at the end of World War II in the form of a UN system and its associated bodies of international norms, uh, laws, and practice. Uh, that's it's based on the UN Charter, combined state sovereignty, rights of national self determination, and human rights. And so, the UN Charter of 1945, banned war as an instrument of policy, provided a framework for the peaceful resolution of international conflicts. And and then you had the sort of the concept of powers. You know, and we, I mean, obviously familiar with the terms, which was you had the Security Council um, with the five permanent members that had the veto power, and it. That was the key why the UN worked and the League of Nations did not work because you know the UN obviously it respected the prerogatives of the great powers. And, uh, and then he says, this is a model based on sovereign internationalism where the respective interests of all the great powers, of all the powers, great and small, are respected. Um, and then this, the assertion of sovereignty is tempered by an internationalism based on the charter system uh, yet it remains within the realist tradition of international relations. So I think that that's kind of the summary of the way the UN worked um, and continues to work. Um, and then he says the second new world order was the one more narrowly created and led by the US. Uh, and then he says here, this is a model based on liberal internationalism consisting of two key elements, the open trading and financial system uh, created within the framework of the Bretton Woods Agreement 
Um, and, and then the military arm that took shape as the Cold War intensified, culminating in the signing of the Washington Treaty of 1949 that created NATO. And this is the term liberal in the Cold War largely signified anti-communist rather than liberal democratic, yet it provided a powerful and ultimately successful framework to overcome the Soviet adversary. Um, this was a hegemonic peace order dominated by the US and its allies. At the end of the Cold War and the disintegration of the USSR in 1991, it proclaimed not only its victory, but also its universality. There could be no yeah, spheres yeah. of influence since the leadership of the US-led hegemonic peace was proclaimed global and universal project. Now, when you read this, you say, yeah, but that, that sounds about right. And it seems to me like the first order <laughs> sounds like a much more appealing one than this order, which uh, says everyone has got to get with the program uh, dominated by the US, Great Britain, NATO, and its various hangers on like Japan and South Korea, uh, or else. Um, yeah. yeah, go on. <laughs> But I mean, George, that this is very interesting. I mean, Richard Sacco is a very a meticulous guy. You know, I've read his stuff. I've met him. He's a very deep thinker. OK. And, you know, he sets everything up in a pristine way. I really admire. However, you know, when you think about the title of the article, I'm not really sure where the folly is. OK. And I kind of anticipated, well, well what's who's 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 committing folly? OK. Um, I was disappointed. Um, but here, you know, the way he describes it, the term liberal in the Cold War largely signified anti-communism rather, rather than liberal democratic. I agree. That's very smart. OK. This was a hegemonic peace order dominated by the United States and its allies. The, the more you read this, I, I have to say, if I were talking to Richard, Richard, but this is a very good description, but is it a good idea? Well, I mean, that's that, yeah. and, that, and that's that, exactly that, that's the question. And when you get this, this is a very long article, and George and I will try to do justice to it. But I mean, this is in the very beginning of the article, and that I already start having doubts. Like, where are you going? Because is this a good idea? Essentially, you get the impression, and I, you know, maybe one day I'll meet him and talk to him about. It, but is this hegem hegemony a good idea? Yeah, that's a, well, that's exactly right, and it and um, and ultimately. What's in it for everybody else? Yeah. Um, because uh, Germany is it, it, it's not divisible, folks. Okay. Right. That's right. So uh, uh, you know, in, in the old system, and he's right, it was kind of you know uh, part of traditional great power politics, concept of uh, powers, and so on, which was that you had um, the UN where disputes would be resolved. And then you had the two rival blocks. You know, you had the you know the Soviet bloc, then you had the uh, the U.S. led bloc. That allowed many states in the world a room in which to maneuver because they could then move from one to the other, and therefore they had flexibility. Um, you know, and therefore it's a far more appealing order than the one being conceived here, which is there is just simply one way forward. And that's the one dominated by the United States and uh, its subordinates. What's in it for everybody else? It's, it's hard to yeah. see. And, and, and OK, I, I suppose, what, you know, the golden rule, those that have the gold make the rules. I guess that's what this is saying here, because uh, how could it be? Again, the outcome, the way the West perceived the, the Cold War is its universality. But that is just you can you can claim universality when you have hegemony. OK, now hegemony. As we, he even talks about later, is is a uh, rather dangerous concept. And then we get to this universality. That's not something that you know people freely of their own volition accept. You have to. You're, there's a there's a, a, a element of coercion for you right. to accept universality. Well, that's right. Um, and and that's the that's the point. I mean, if you have if you're controlling uh, all the instruments of power in the world through, it says free trade, but you can extend it through all of the economic and financial instruments of the world, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the dollar, um, uh, the, exactly the dollar. Um, and, and then you've got all the military power, uh, you, you know, that you've accumulated. Um, you know, they, what else is this other than hegemony? 
either you get with the program or we are going to hit you and hit you hard. And that's in fact what took place after 1991 when one country after another got clobbered. Some literally got clobbered with bombs. Others got clobbered with uh, awful uh, sanctions. Uh, so, you know, that's it. That, you know, there's only one way forward. Anyway. Well, um, and even, yeah. even he says, I'm sorry, if you go back in the last sentence of that, uh, of that slide, uh, again, it, for me, it, it prompts questions. Hence, this expansive system perceived as aggression to outsiders is usually described as liberal he hegemony. I mean, how, that's like that's like putting lipstick on a pig. I mean, if others perceive it as aggressive, how can you call it liberal? Okay. Right, I mean, right. I, I think a lot of people that when, when we use this kind of jargon, I think nominally speaking, we think liberal is a basically a positive thing. Okay. Right. Um, uh, right. I mean, George and I at the core of it are uh, are classical liberals. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, I, again, I mean, it's exactly. I mean, I think liberal is regarded, yeah, as as a good word. You know, it's like everything else. You know, that's a that's a good word. That's something that uh, is desirable, and so therefore the opposite, by definition, becomes something undesirable. So hence, when we have the rules based order. Um, exactly. we, that, that which is also that's part of liberalism that the rules based order and therefore anyone who objects to it is against liberalism and against rules I mean what can what can be you know worse than that um, yeah but so, so so you have liberal hegemony I mean it's, so I mean what the point George are trying to make so I mean as, as opposed to like uh, liberal slavery I mean, how can how can you you uh, uh, put a preposition in front of he hegemony? I question that. Go ahead. So it says a modicum of goodwill and trust could have allowed some sort of a reconciliation between these two models. However, the tension between the two was reinforced by the geopolitical contest between the two divergent spatial visions. On the one side, the Euro-Atlantic alliance system created to fight Cold War One did not dissolve after 1989, but instead enlarged into the area vacated by the disintegration of the Soviet bloc. Now, here you have the, the point is that you, you've got, again, well, this, we, we expand into this. Well, what about those who don't like it? They don't care you, for you are expanding. That is regarded and would be regarded as, and was regarded as aggressive. I mean, if you're expanding, at the at the expense of someone else, then um, that is aggression. And I mean, I mean, the one you would have thought part of liberalism would be consent, the consent of somebody. I mean, if you're not, if you have liberalism and it doesn't go with consent, then I don't quite see what it has to do with uh, with liberalism. I mean, there was no consent yeah, I mean in what NATO did. I, I would ask Richard Sakwa the following. Would he agree with the slight uh, tweaking of this sentence? On the one side, the Euro-Atlantic alliance system created to fight World, Cold War I did not dissolve after 1989, but instead aggressively enlarged into the area vacated by the disintegration. Of the, would he agree with putting that word in there? Yeah, that's right. Because I, I would say it would be more accurate. Okay. No, I, 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 I agree. I agree. Um, and then it says two normative models contested, and the contradiction was reinforced by divergent geopolitical representations, blah, blah. The failure to reconcile the two visions of post Cold War European order generated growing distrust that grew into outright hostility. Both sides believed that truth and justice was on their side thus prompting the denigration of the alternative and even demonization of, um, of the opponent. Cold War Manichaeanism was reproduced to a degree that even surpassed uh, that of Cold War I. By, 19, by 2022, Moscow assumed that the contest would be a rather more equal one. But the thing is that, I, yes. as, far as, as far as I can see, um, this you know, a contest was all being waged by the Western side because <laughs> it wasn't Russia that was expanding. I mean, it, it, you know, you were expanding <laughs> at, at Russia's expense and you did it right away. I mean, it, you know, they, they, they barely had time to pause for breath after getting rid of communism, getting rid of the Soviet Union, getting rid of the Warsaw Pact, and you were already there 
moving in uh, on what again on territories that have been their allies. Um, well, where you know, where's George, the symmetry? There's no symmetry there. The Russians exactly. aren't doing anything like that. The failure to reconcile. Was there any attempt to reconcile? No. I, I would say the, the Russian side a, a number of times. The first time uh, uh, Putin was in office, um, uh, when uh, uh, Dmitry Medvedev was talking about a common European house. Um, uh, you know, but the, it was the the West, the, the United States that left the ABM treaty, other arms control treaty. I mean, there, there was no attempt to reconcile whatsoever. Okay, I mean, I, 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 I'm absolutely left speechless by the, by that sentence. Yeah. There, it, there were attempts, but the West made no attempt to reconcile. Right. Yes, I, I, I agree. Um, and then the question now was how those demands would be advanced. In November 2021, Russia cut diplomatic ties with NATO after the bloc expelled eight Russian diplomats uh, from its mission um, uh, in Brussels against the background of Russian military deployments adjacent to Ukraine um, on 17th of December 2021. Russia submitted the two draft treaties, um, but there's a but repeating, he says here, repeating some of the themes of Medvedev's proposal in 2009. So, you know, thank um, you. And then it says one was addressed to the US, the other to NATO. And then the, the documents contain three demands no further NATO enlargement, uh, covering obviously in the first instance Ukraine and Georgia, no deployment of weaponry or military forces on the border with Russia, and NATO's return to the force posture of 1997 when the NATO-Russia founding act was uh, signed. Um, and so, so, but, you know, that's, of course, um, uh, uh, correct. But uh, again, these, uh, you know, they're not unreasonable demands. And then, and then you, you have to say all of these things that they're demanding, those are things that NATO had done at the expense of Russia. You know, it's not like Russia was demanding. We demand setting up a base in uh, Argentina, we demand a base in the Caribbean. Um, we want absolute uncontrolled uh, maneuvering in the uh, English Channel. They're not asking for that. They just say we, we don't want you moving your forces right next to our borders. Well, uh, George, uh, the the documents contain three key elements. You've already read them. That was an attempt at reconciliation. Yeah. Reconcile, right? Uh, the uh, um, the competing and differing um, on narratives, worldviews, uh, whatever sp he likes the word spatial. I don't know why. Um, that was the the last attempt to reconcile, and it was completely dismissed out of hand. None of these things are outrageous. Okay, all of them have been at Russia's expense. I don't see how Russia would be get the upper hand or or win, no, no, as no, they no. say. Basically, what they were saying, you know, what, what, you know, basically what the Russians are saying, this is a win-win for everybody. Everybody wins here, right. but no, it would not because of the uh, of the interpretation that the the Soviet Union was a de vanquished, defeated country. Russia's a successor state had to take on that that um, uh, that that position of being vanquished. That is something the Russians. Have That's right. That, exactly. So, not only that it was to be treated as a, a vanquished power. Um, but he couldn't uh, in any way um, enjoy the respect that the Soviet Union had once enjoyed. So in other words, if, if the Soviet Union had you know, made demands uh, and uh, you know, they, that would be regarded as reasonable demands. Remember, you know, even Ken Kennedy made that concession on Turkey, uh, removing the Jupiter missiles uh, from uh, Turkey. Uh, and then, as we've said many times before, Eisenhower didn't get involved in Hungary in 56. Johnson didn't get involved in Czechoslovakia in 68. So they enjoyed that, that, that kind of respect. But the, uh, the NATO powers, and that means the United States, said, you will not enjoy that respect. We will not take you into consideration. What we accorded the Soviet Union, we're not going to accord to you. Um, and so, so that, that, that was uh, obviously something that uh, Russia could hardly live with. Um, and this is the, the combination of military and diplomatic initiatives forced a substantive U.S.-Russian dialogue on European security for the first time since 
the negotiations over German unification in 1919. But those negotiations of German unification were entirely at Russia's expense. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, you, you, got, one you got everything you wanted. You know, the Soviet Union got nothing. I mean, it's like, you know, well, these are substantive negotiations. Basically, we were ready to promise you anything, like not one inch eastward. Yeah, we will say, we don't mean it, of course, but we'll tell you, yeah, not one inch eastward. So they, they were ready to give, you know, promise anything because they knew they wouldn't be worth the paper it was written on. Um, and then... Uh, and this was a major Russian achievement. Putin had long signaled Russian dissatisfaction, uh, dating at least from. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, I, uh, signif which already signified a major Russian achievement. What? That was an achievement. <laughs> you mean, the, the... George has pointed out very, very many, uh, numerous times here, is that the the Warsaw Pact. Sure, we'll dissolve it, but we're going to keep our bases in Berlin. Yeah. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. No, that, 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 that's right. There was no, that no, wasn't no. a Russian achievement. It was a Russian surrender. Right. Unilateral. They got right. nothing for it. Right. And it, it's no surprise to anyone, George F. Kennan even said the same thing, that this was this was this kind of, this unilateral approach is is fraught with danger. And right. here we are in the danger. I'm sorry, right. keep going, right. George. No, 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 that, that's right. And then it says, for the first time in 30 years, Russia's security concerns were being discussed at the highest diplomatic level, although that does not mean that they were being taken seriously. No, I, I, okay. it, it really didn't. <laughs> well, thank you. All through this article, I just want to interject this. Richard is arguing our case for us, but anyway. No, but but, but that's, whoa, whoa, you know, look, you know, look at you. you, your your concerns are being taken seriously. Well done, you know. Well, you know, you you, you know, it's, imagine it's like a schoolboy, you know, you know, God, look, you know, the headmaster is, you know, reading your essay, you know, well, you know, look, you know, you you've done a good you've done a good job today. Um, what does that even mean? You mean you're supposed to be flattered because uh, you know the Americans deigned to read your proposal. And then, and then it didn't did deign, and he, which he doesn't say he, they didn't deign to uh, present in public Officially, their response to the, yeah, exactly. They didn't publish their response to uh, Russia's proposals. Um, so, um, and then he says, Russia was effectively demanding veto rights in European security matters, something that had never been granted since 1990. This was crisis diplomacy of the first order. Uh, as far as the Western powers were concerned, there was nothing to discuss since the fundamental principles has been established. So there was nothing to discuss. So it's just exactly, it's just saying, yeah. So <laughs> there were, these discussions were quite meaningless. Um, well, but, that, but that's not true. I mean, this is an exaggeration. Russia effectively, Russia was effectively demanding veto rights in European security matters. No, the Helsinki process wasn't a veto process. Right. It was it was con consultations. It was negotiations. It was rough going, go, going back to 1990. Richard, you know a lot more history than you're you're letting your reader know. Okay, right. and it's not, and veto again. It, it's so dramatic. No, no. The, 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 what what Russia was effectively saying is that the po the post Cold War order is has collapsed. That it's uh, security, it is uh, insecurity is uh, rife everywhere. We're pointing it out to you. We've right. given you a solution, at least a starting point, to start alleviating those problems. They, they uh, again, this they always say this. You know, you you don't have veto rights, but the West has veto rights. That's exactly that's what I was going to say. Exactly, but you have veto rights. You have veto rights over what goes on in Yugoslavia. You have veto rights what went on in Serbia. You have veto rights what went on in Belarus. Which is you know a close ally. I mean, you've imposed I don't know how many ways of sanctions um, on uh, Belarus. Um, so you have veto rights. You know that that's why you impose sanctions because you you have a right to tell other countries what to do. But you, you know, again, you're not prepared to allow Russia to have any say in anything, not even in, in its own domestic affairs. I mean, you know, you know, basically, America believes it has a right to interfere in Russia's internal affairs, but it got completely hysterical, it's got its knickers in a twist in 2017. My God, Russia interfered in our election. This is the worst thing that has happened to the United States since Pearl Harbor and 9-11. Yes, when, when, when Michael uh, McFowell, before he became uh, ambassador, that ill-fated uh, 
um, uh, adventure that he had here. I, I, I said it was the wrong man at the wrong time in the wrong place with the wrong ideas. I mean, he, he you know, he, he um, was openly saying that, you know, Medvedev should be the next president. We have to move Putin out, you know, and he was basically trying to control, you know, saying to Medvedev, we got your back, you know, I mean, and of course, Medvedev did saying, you people, there you go, you crazy Americans, you know, why are you getting involved in our affairs? That's right. And Biden, Biden told Putin, don't, don't come oh, yeah. back. Don't, don't you come yeah. back. <laughs> Um, um, and then he says, um, the liberal peace order promised freedom and prosperity, and in any case presented itself as defensive. Let me say it presented itself where's as defensive. Where's the peace? Where is the where, freedom? Where, where, where yeah, is where, the where, where's the, yeah, where's the, but, but notice presented itself. Well, anyone can present, everyone presents himself as defensive. Every, everyone's doing it. Hey, well, I, you know, you know, I mean, it's, I'm defensive. Uh, you know, I'm waging a war, but it's still defensive. I mean, nobody says, well, I'm, I'm an aggressor. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and so and you say, yeah, you know, I'm just doing it to defend myself. Um, and, <laughs> Nobody says they're the aggressor. That's absolutely right. Everybody else made me do it. Okay. Yeah, that's right. The U.S. worked with the European partners and NATO to expand its model of post-Cold War uh, peace order and between 1990 and 2021 effectively suppressed the existence of the second model. And then critics argued that there was no need to revisit Helsinki principles, um, hence rejected the idea of a Helsinki II conference. And this is worse, the fact that the main dialogue was conducted between Washington and Moscow with at most consultations with European powers uh, reeked of some sort of Yalta II where the fate of small states was decided by the great powers. The problem was that many of the small states were irreconcilable in their hostility to Russia and contemptuous of its security concerns. There could be no negotiated resolution to the crisis with their participation, but any agreement without their participation would lack legitimacy and smack of the logic of Yalta. In the absence of a reconvened Helsinki II conference, unless Washington and Moscow came to some sort of agreement, the impasse was complete. In presenting the draft security treaties, Moscow promised a military technical response if negotiations failed, but did not specify what form they would take. But the thing about this Yalta thing is that, um, you know, the West kind of got itself into this position of uh, scooping up states that were indeed irreconcilable in their hostility toward Russia. So you you basically kind of outsource your foreign policy to um, to, to, to small states. Um, and that's not a good idea because ultimately peace depends on agreement among the great powers. It doesn't depend on tiny little states, uh, you know, yapping away. I mean, it's, it's, it's the big dogs that have to come to an agreement, not the, not the little dogs yapping away. So uh, to say, oh, well, we're so worried about Yalta. I mean, the reason there was Yalta is these were the great powers. I mean, it was obvious then that the Soviet Union and the United States would be the big powers that would dominate the post-war world. Therefore, they were the ones who had to agree at Tehran, Yalta, and Potsdam. Well, of course. And, and 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 the realities on the ground dictated the that outcome, the Yalta um, result. Is it well that Eisenhower, you know, he knew that there would be no backing back home after the Great Depression, after the war, to station millions of American troops in Europe. There was no appetite for it, there was no interest in doing it. And all the realists at the time. The Soviet army is there. There's not much we can do about it. Okay, I'm not making a moral judgment here. I'm talking about geopolitics here. But, you know, George, again, I'm very dis disappointed with this analysis here. So essentially, it's little powers should dictate to large powers what their, their interests are. Right. I mean, that's just ridiculous, okay? That's not how the world has ever worked. No, 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 no that, 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 that's exactly right. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's peace depends on the great powers coming to um, uh, an agreement. And again, if, we, if we're going to talk about the United Nations uh, and the creation of the Security Council, that was another product of Yalta. I mean, that was again, we set, we set up this uh, United Nations Security Council that respects the prerogatives of the great powers and that essentially puts, you know, there's a, there's a ranking 
uh, at the UN. You have the permanent members and everybody else. Uh, it, not everybody, you know, if you could go down this path, oh, everybody's equal, then you're going to have a League of Nations, and therefore, you know, it's just going to dissolve in in about a decade. Well, well, George, this whole time, reconvening a Helsinki 2 conference. Well, if anyone was, and there were people considering it because, let me think here, because Helsinki 1 wasn't working, okay? Right. I mean, I mean, in this paragraph here, it was working fine for the West. It was yeah. working fine for NATO. Right. So, so, you know, it's not broken. Why fix it? Again, this is such a crude uh, disregard for the one of the, the, set, the one of two equal players in the Helsinki process all along. Okay, and right. because of NATO expansion, it dissolved the meaningfulness of that. The whole idea of indivisibility of security had collapsed. Right. I, I don't understand all the verbiage here. We could have, yeah. I could, we, you and I could, you know, summarize a critique yeah. of this paragraph yeah. in two lines. Um, response when it came on 26th of January, this is the Russian response, was disappointing. Uh, no, this, this is the American response. When it, it was disappointing for Moscow, although hardly surprising, the demand uh, of a written guarantee that Ukraine would not join NATO was rejected, insisting on the right of other states to choose or change security arrangements. The NATO response offered general transparency and confidence building measures such as briefing on each other's military briefing. exercises, consultations, establishing Paging. a civilian hotline, re-establishing military missions in Brussels and Moscow. The U.S. response insisted on maintaining an open-door policy on enlargement, but it was ready to, to discuss uh, reciprocal commitments by the U.S. and Russia to refrain from deploying offensive ground-based missile systems and permanent forces with a combat mission on the territory of Ukraine. Um, as far well, what, a, what a concession, George. What right. a concession. And wow. That, that, that's the point that, um, wow. you know, to say, okay, well, we won't deploy uh, these offensive missiles in Ukraine, but we'll deploy them in Poland. Well, that takes five minutes to move them from uh, Poland to Ukraine. I mean, <laughs> I mean these, these are missiles that, you know, it takes them a few minutes to reach their target in Moscow. I mean, it's like, so you know, that wasn't the issue. The issue was Ukraine in NATO. Um, and then as for returning to the four states of 1997, Washington insisted that their current deployment was limited, proportionate, and in full compliance with the commitments under the NATO-Russia founding act. So Washington insisted on this, but, you know, well, okay, you can go on <laughs> insisting on them, whatever you like. <laughs> you know, you just have to see it my way, okay? That's it, and everything yeah. will be fine. Yeah. <laughs> God, it just Washington insisted. <laughs> um, and then said, continuing dialogue was promised, although Russia needed to de-escalate its forces on Ukraine's border. The U.S. was ready to continue arms control discussion in Moscow, including limits on uh, deployment of ballistic missiles, nuclear equipped bombers. The new idea of transparency mechanism to verify the absence of Tomahawk missiles capable of reaching, reaching Russian territory, um, you know, from sites in Romania and Poland, in return for which the U.S. would be uh, offered access to um, missile sites in uh, Russia. Um, so here it says, a new, this says it, a new idea was a transparency mechanism to verify the absence of uh, Tomahawk missiles. Now, the point is the Russians are saying, yeah, but you can change it at any moment. I mean, you're, you're there, you can change them just to say, well, we don't have the Tomahawk missiles today. You can move them in at any time <laughs> tomorrow. Um, so again, it wasn't addressing um, Russia's uh, concerns. And, uh, and, and, and it's it, holding, it was it's holding Russian concerns in contempt. Exactly. In contempt. Right. You know, this is what's mine is mine is what yours is negotiable approach. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and then it appeared that everything was leading to war. This was long anticipated. But when it actually started with Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 24th of February, it came as a surprise. All the signs were there. Yet a full scale invasion in the heart of Europe in the 21st century appeared inconceivable. However, as we have argued, the logic of conflict was inherent in the failure to establish an inclusive and indivisible security order in post-Cold War Europe. 
Agreed. However, yeah. Agreed. However, Agreed. up to Russia, up to 2022, Russia had limited itself to short and uh, usually reactive interventions, such as in Georgia in August 2008, uh, where the possibility of marching onto Tbilisi was rejected, and Crimea, uh, and then to a degree unwittingly in the uh, Donbass from April of that year. But the thing is that, you know, just because that's the way it had been before, you can't just assume that's the way it will always be. I mean, Russians have been giving clear warnings. I mean, if we're talking about um, uh, Putin's speech in 2007, that's 15 years ago. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of warnings that you've been hearing. And, and particularly from what was going on last year, from 2021, these warnings were becoming more and more serious and um, more, more and more grim. Um, you know, then the question is, well, why, why did you ignore this? Um, and you, you know, well, 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 George, you know, George, I mean, you know, again, let's zoom out. I mean, you know, the Russians, you know, you know, when, when belatedly, when the, the, the West started um, invoking the Helsinki process, the Russians were the first to do that, uh, but they caught on to it. And, but all, you know, in toto, Russia it was saying, during the Helsinki process, we were a major stakeholder, okay? Right. Now, now, the way you have interpreted that process since the end of the Cold War is that we're a minor, if an absent stakeholder. What Russia was doing for 15 years from the Munich speech in 2007 to the president said, we are a major stakeholder. Please at right. least recognize that. And there right, was well, no that, recognition of it. Yeah, no, I think that, that, that's right. And when you think of it, that um, what the, the, the point they're making here, the Russians have been making, uh, you know, that... that uh, security is indivisible and that that is a part of the Helsinki process, simply insisting, well, I can do whatever I like and I don't have to take into account anyone else's concern. As you say, that wasn't working for Russia. And and they were willing, they, you know, willing. Well, Russia said they will accept NATO expansion. What they won't accept is NATO infrastructure um, exactly. <laughs> developing in all of those territories that had hitherto been Russia's buffer zone um, and, and, during the and, Cold War. And a corollary of that, and it, and it goes right up to the immediate outbreak of the conflict, is that in, in, in Ukraine is a non-member, official non-member of Ukraine, installing NATO infrastructure. So it's a moot point, okay? I mean, right. you, you have, but you know, Ukraine wasn't a member of NATO. I mean, hear all of these cries, okay? Right. But it, that doesn't matter. That's neither here nor there. NATO infrastructure right up to the Donbass does matter. That's right, that's right. But that's why, but I, I was just saying that the, the post nine, when they said, let's go back to the status quo ante in 1997, uh, when we signed the NATO-Russia founding act, remember the big, all the NATO expansion took place after 1997. Sure. So, you know there was no NATO enlargement. You know the first one came in 1999, and then we had you know all the all the massive you know uh, 2004, and then and then all the rest, all the way up to whenever what was it? When was Macedonia incorporated? 2020, so whatever. You know, it's, I mean, it's all taking place. In my yeah. Not a big day on my calendar, but not I, a yeah. big day. Uh, but but that's the point. They say, hey, well, let's you know, we signed an agreement in 1997. This is the the, the founding act, and then since then you've been kind of <laughs> encroaching into our uh, uh, space. Defensively, defensively, yeah. Defen purely defense. It's all purely defensive. Um, a flurry of diplomacy followed the Western response to uh, Moscow's proposals. Numerous Western leaders visiting Moscow, Macron was particularly active, uh, but in his final meeting with Putin in Moscow on the 7th of February, he was unable to offer much. Oh, well, I think, I, think that was, I think that was kind of obvious. Uh, the Normandy format uh, leaders met in the run-up to the war, but it was clear that Ukraine was in no mood to fulfill the Minsk II agreement of 20, 2015 which provided a formula for the return of the Donbass to Ukrainian sovereignty. There are good reasons why Kiev may not have wished to fulfill its terms, which effectively amounted to a transformation of the polity, but some version was the only way to resolving the conflict peacefully. But you see, that's the thing that um, 
if you sign an agreement, then it's incumbent upon you to fulfill the terms of the agreement. You can't just simply say, well, I mean, there was a good reason why I didn't do it. So I just didn't do it. I know, I know. I, I intended to pay you back the money I owed you, but there were very good reasons why I didn't. So I'm just not going to do it. Well, there it is. Well, yeah, and I'm I really, uh, I'm, I'm a little confused here, and I think this is a little bit of uh, disingenuous wordplay. There are good reasons why Kiev may not have wished to fulfill its terms, which effectively amounted to a transformation of the polity. What are you talking about? You're talking about Azov, you're talking about Prava Sector, you're talking about all these other groups that started pressuring the uh, post-coup leaders. Is that is that what he's saying? Well, which I, is kind I, of I, I, took, I took it, what he was saying is that if that became autonomous, then other parts of Ukraine would demand autonomy and that Ukraine might begin the process towards um, dissolution. Um, well, I mean, that was always that, that was always the nightmare of many in Kiev and in Washington, is that if the Donbass were to effectively get what it wanted, then you would see the slow dis dis uh, disintegration of Ukraine. Maybe that's what he's me and what he meant. Right. Here. That's what I assumed he meant here. But then you can just say, well, I mean, if you can't uh, stay together, then you have to uh, Stop, you know, giving people uh, autonomy. The alternative, of course, is to use massive force to repress, um, you know, any desires for self determination, which is <laughs> the, the the view that um, essentially the Western powers were urging on Kiev: use force and crush um, these uh, people who are demanding autonomy. And um, that's why that's why Crimea got out when the get getting was good. Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, so then he says, um, the two sides had very different representations of what it meant and neither fulfilled its obligations. Worse, in the days before the invasion, the two breakaway republics were subjected to massive artillery bombardment from the Ukrainian yeah. side. This was in keeping with the long-term pattern with over 80% of the civilian casualties caused by active hostilities since 2018, coming on the separatist side. The central government in Kiev had long been passing laws prohibiting the use of Russian language and even Russian culture from official usage, education, and the mass media. By 2022, not a single school or university in Ukraine offered an education in Russian, even though some 18% of the population were designated as ethnic Russian and over 60% had earlier used Russian as their primary language. The history of the country was rewritten to present a favorable picture of Nazi collaborators and to negate any positive representations of traditional Russo-Ukrainian ties. Russian language newspapers and TV channels were closed and the opposition leader Medvedchuk placed under house arrest. Now this is pretty this, this damning. Is part, this is part of the liberal order, right? This is part of the liberal order. So he puts all this in. And this is this is very damning. And then you say, well, yeah. okay. I mean, you you've now set all this out. Um, you can't keep saying that that what happened was unprovoked. I mean, this is very serious stuff here, and it is striking that the Western powers, the values. Remember Stoltenberg, the values, Ursula von der Leyen, values. They didn't seem to raise any issues with that. I mean, they had no problem about this repression of the ethnic minority. And this is just not just Russians. I mean, they did this to the Hungarian minorities, did this to the Poles, you know, this, this was a, you know, um, they, they went along with this um, and still blamed everything on uh, on Russia. You know, they just kept saying, oh, it's Russia, Russia that that's uh, uh, being obstreperous. It's Russia's fault those people speak Russian. That's <laughs> George. Exactly, that is, exactly. And th that's not a joke, That is that, because they, they actually do say, well, Ukraine has every right to insist on Ukrainization and to forge a national identity. So therefore it's uh, it's perfectly within, the, uh, within their jurisdiction to uh, insist that everybody only speaks Ukrainian. Where, in, what, in what country in the EU is that uh, enforced, George? Um, yeah, that, that, that's that's a uh, that, that that's right. That's a, that, that's. I don't think it is. I mean, I mean, I think no, it, countries, it's against, countries it's that, that we would. I mean, well, we, we we took a, we we had we've done gaggles before on what goes on in the Baltic states, um, and I think that that's clearly coming in the Baltic states. 
uh, again, Russians. Well, they, some... just, be, just because they do it doesn't mean it isn't in violation of European Union oh, laws. Absolutely. They are a complete violation, and they're never called out for it. Never okay. called out for it, and in violation of all of them. I mean, you know, you, all, yeah. all of the Treaty of the European it's a Human Union. Rights. Exactly, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, European Convention on Human Rights. I mean, you know, you you name it. You know, all all those solemn treaties that the EU is always signing is violation of all of them. Yeah, well, how many times is, is uh, uh, Hungary called on the carpet for the treatment of um, um, the um, Roma? The Roma, yeah, yeah. The, the Roma, all the time, okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Russian concerns were augmented by the flood of weapons pouring into Ukraine. Making our point. Thank you. <laughs> with the distinction between defensive and lethal weapons long abandoned. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> to the extent that the, these, these terms ever mean anything. But it appeared that all the trend lines were running against Russia. Moscow was almost certainly aware that since 2015, the CIA had been training Ukrainian special forces and uh, intelligence officers in the art of guerrilla warfare. I like the way almost certainly aware. I, I say that it's not even almost certainly, it was definitely aware. They kept talking about it. So. Well, they, he's got a footnote after it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then um, Russia's concerns were heightened by Zelensky's speech in Munich, in which he not only repeated his opposition to Minsk II, but also stated that Ukraine was considering withdrawal from the Budapest Memorandum are, and reviewing Ukraine's non-nuclear status. He argued that the security guarantee is promised by the Budapest Memorandum in return for Ukraine giving up the Soviet nuclear forces stationed on its territory was no longer valid. In normal circumstances, such a statement violating Ukraine's commitments um, blah, blah, and associated accession to the non-proliferation treaty would have been met with condemnation. Iran and North Korea have been severely sanctioned as a result of their real or putative nuclear ambitions, yet Zelensky's statement encountered an eloquent silence. Great paragraph. Great paragraph. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the... No uh, argument. <laughs> you think okay? I mean, I, I'm I'm sold. I'm, I'm, I, 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 <laughs> sold to the man in the blue shirt. <laughs> um, it is clear that in launching the invasion of Putin, in the launching the invasion, Putin miscalculated in at least four ways. So, so he, you know, you you've now presented, you know, a, a bill of goods, and you think, well, all right. I mean, I think that that's Pretty much, you know, you you you've argued that Russia w was in a really tight spot. I mean, you know, everything that Ukraine was doing, there's no question Ukraine would have gone for nuclear weapons. I mean, there's just there's no question of that. Um, I mean, that that that's what where it was um, heading, um, and uh, and you know we know that you know the Russian language would have been completely uh, extirpated from uh, Ukraine. Um, almost certainly, there would have been a military offensive. Uh, in the Donbass to drive out the Russians. And we know that NATO would have looked upon with benignly and would have facilitated this. They would have you know, provided the arms for it. So what else could Russia and, and do? Newland, and Victoria Newland, you know, the one that got away, you know, Crimea. Yeah. So he says, Miss Putin miscalculated. The first is that he underestimated the scale of Ukrainian resistance and overestimated the capacity of the Russian military. <laughs> it seems that he believed that the light touch blitzkrieg would force Ukraine to capitulate. Instead, Zelensky turned out to be an inspirational wartime leader. Ukrainian forces put up stiff resistance and the population certainly did not welcome Russian troops with bread and salt. At first, there was the clear intention to avoid civilian casualties, but this was soon dropped. Instead, Russian forces got bogged down in siege warfare on Kiev, Kharkov, and Mariupol. The very idea of trying to seize Kiev, a city of 3 million people by force in the 21st century, was a reckless and cruel ambition. 
Um, I, don't, I don't really want to comment on this. You and I have talked about this so many times. And and all I would say is that you put that on the side. This conflict is not over. Let's see if that paragraph will be rewritten in three months, nine months, 12 months. So I, I don't see we, we need to waste our breath on this. Okay. On this one. Sure. Um, the second miscalculation was the scale of the Western response. Moscow claims that it had evaluated all the risks but it soon became clear that it had underestimated the intensity of the response, prompted in part by the appalling human suffering of Ukrainian civilians uh, in the path of Russian forces, but also generated by resentment at Russia's long-term refusal to play by the rules of liberal hegemony. Well, I don't see that, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. if you're, if, if you're um, a, a appalled by human suffering, then, you know, it's incumbent upon you to come in with uh, some some sort of a way of bringing this to an end. How is sending in more arms uh, going to end human suffering? I mean, that, that makes absolutely no sense. I mean, they, he, he's here, he's imbibing NATO propaganda, which is, well, the way to bring uh, the suffering to an end is by flooding the, the, the zone with uh, more arms. So it's, it's Russia's, all of this is because it's all Russia's fault because we wouldn't play by the rules of liberal hegemony. That is a bizarre, right. vacuous statement, okay? Right. Right. I mean, almost to the point of just invalidating the entire article. We wasted right. a lot of time to get to that sentence, George. Right, right, yeah, that's right. Um, the third miscalculation was to overestimate the Russian popular appetite for war. The return of Crimea to Russian jurisdiction in 2014 was accompanied by a wave of enthusiasm. And then there was no such sentiment this time. The propaganda effects of the state-run media in the internet age and ferocious repression against critics of the war could do only so much. In fact, with so many family ties between Russians and Ukrainians, the suffering inflicted on civilians quickly resonated at home. Opinion polls before the war certainly indicated no war fever. And even the state-controlled mass media had done little to prepare the nation for a war with a brotherly people. Okay, George, first of all, there is no um, um, Russian popular appetite for war. That is just an absurd statement, absurd, okay? Russians lose a lot of troops and civilians during wars. There's no appetite to repeat it. So I'm, uh, I'm offended by that sentence, okay? Um, the rest of it is everything is in flux here. Yeah, there are people here that don't like the conflict. They say it openly. They're not repressed or anything like that. They can quit their job. They can move. A lot of people have. But there's no indication that there is a backlash against this. People, are, Russians are very stoic. It's been explained to them, I think, coherently and honestly, that our back is up against the wall. This is what we've had to do. We didn't want to do it. We gave them ample uh, number of chances to turn uh, change course, and they did not take us seriously. Well, they're taking us seriously now. Okay. Um, and then the fourth miscalculation is effectively the combined effects of the first three, the destabilization of the Russian political order itself. The war, no was, the war was both an act of aggression and of self-harm with damaging consequences for generations to come. Even if Russia was able to subdue Ukrainian resistance and take the main sites, the occupation forces would be subject to an enduring, savage, and demoralizing guerrilla war, not unlike that endured by Napoleon's forces in the Iberian Peninsula. And then, as in the post-war insurgency against Soviet forces, Western Ukraine would act as a reservoir of partisan warfare as would uh, the neighboring states, above all Poland. Even if a pro-Russian government was installed in Kiev, it would enjoy little to no legitimacy, especially after the savagery of the warfare that took it uh, to the capital. And then uh, Ukraine, moreover, would become part of the... But the thing is about that is that, well, how, how do we know that? Um, you know, we, we, we simply don't know that. I mean, it's, uh, you know, this is entirely speculative. So, oh, well, it would have no... Um, uh, legitimate as well. I don't know. I mean, you, you, it might be at the same time that it, it would still be preferable to um, what you had before. I mean, you clearly had disastrous um, governments in Ukraine since 1991. I mean, you basically Ukraine since 1991 has been a failed state. I mean, this was the first time they'd ever become independent 
and they haven't done a very good job of it. So, um, you know, you may be right there and, on, you know, these terrible consequences, but ultimately we just don't know how, how Ukraine would respond to essentially the ouster of the, uh, the Zelensky gang. Well, George, when, when the, the people of the Donbass got their chance to finally leave, they left. When the people of Crimea finally had the chance to leave, they left. And, okay, so, you know, again, this is a very curious thing. Things are in flux. We'll have to revisit it in months or a year from now. How, but, George, how many um, popular uprisings have there been in Don, Donetsk over the last eight years? How many, how many popular uprisings and guerrilla warfare has there been in uh, Donetsk? I don't know. There have been sabotages. There's been right. terrorism. But the, the population there definitely feels safer under the um, uh, governance of Moscow than, than they did for the last eight years under right. Kiev. Look at right. Kyrgyzstan. Look at Zaporozhnya. W where are the guerrillas there? Right. I, I don't see them. And, okay? I, and I think, you know, if you, and again, if one looks at the history uh, of uh, Ukraine, I mean, you first of all had, you know, you had one election that was stolen. That was the 20, 2004 election when the, the, the Orange Revolution. Then Yushchenko... Um, what was his opinion poll standing? I think in when, when he ran for re-election, I think four percent or something like that. He decided it, was, not, it was single digit, single, single digit. digit, exactly. Um, so essentially, Ukraine then brought back to power Yanukovych, the one who was overthrown in 2004. Yanukovych uh, came back, um, and then the only way you could get rid of Yanukovych is by overthrowing him again by illegal means. So. It, it's it's hard to say, you know, these people, this this post Maidan crowd, what what's their legitimacy? I mean, it's a you know, you you know, the history indicates that they have no legitimacy uh, in, uh, in in Ukraine. So again, I mean, he's making all sorts of prediction. Oh, there'll be this guerrilla war and so on. And you know, you may be right, but we, sh we shouldn't jump to conclusions. Well, I, I you know, look what happened in Chechnya. Which yeah, I that's, have a good, that's a good example, the Chechnya, exactly. Which I have visited in, um, in a number of uh, cities. And um, I asked, you know, this was long after, you know, Kedirov was uh, um, the younger, was in, uh, the, then and now still there. And I asked people, you know, how do you feel about, you know, the referendum that, that they had um, uh, about uh, maintain, maintaining their relationship with Russia? And to the person, George, everybody said the same thing. Peter... It's better than war. Right. Yeah. No, okay. Exactly. Yeah. And, and where, where, where is the guerrilla action in Chechnya? Where, where is it? Yeah. Well, it's not right. there. Yeah. yeah. Be, are, are they? Is is there a uniform agreement about the outcome? I doubt it. But there's a pretty much a consensus that this is a whole lot better than fighting the Russians. Right. Yeah. 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 That's right. And my my sense is again, I don't want to get you know ahead of our skis here. But, you know, occupation of Ukraine and all that. No, I think there's there has to be a political force that comes to the fore and saying, look, we, we tried it. It didn't work. We don't need them as enemies. We'll, we want to work with the West. We want to work with Russia the way, you know, as I always said, all, you know, it was during the Orange Revolution. I say this on air all the time. Ukraine isn't going anywhere. It isn't going east. It isn't going west. It is Ukraine. OK, and now Ukraine's sovereignty has been compromised because of NATO expansion at the behest of London, at the behest of Washington. I keep saying, well, the more the West helps Ukraine, the smaller it gets. And I've been proven right. Yeah, no, that, that, that's right. And I think that um, it will become increasingly clear that the the, the Maidan government, the, that, that regime that came to power, by violence, by overthrowing the legally elected government, has been a catastrophe. It was a catastrophe for Ukraine. There's no question about it. You know, you may say tremendous leadership and inspirational leader. He's a catastrophe. He's been an absolute disaster for Ukraine. We, we don't know what will uh, remain of Ukraine or the out, or the ultimate uh, outlines of, um, of this post-war Ukraine, but we do know that this has been an absolute disaster uh, for Ukraine. Something that could have been resolved. There was no reason for Kiev to be to to wage this very anti-Russian uh, policy. I mean, for, for all the reasons that, incidentally, uh, Sakwa cites um, that this was asking. He even mentions at some point in the article that oh, Putin was very thin-skinned and so on. Well, I, but you know, whatever you say. Either way, 
you don't want to uh, you, you don't want to cultivate bad relations with your neighbor, and and they did that, and and you know they they basically they paid a price for that. Well, that was a is a is a um um I can't find the right adjective. He's an observer of Russian politics. For him to say Putin has thin skin really stuck out. I I you know our mutual friend Dmitry Babich that we know. I mean I've always asked him I how, how do you explain Russia's patience with the West? And he's always like we don't want war. We don't we don't want to go there. We're going to do try everything to avoid right. it. So thick uh, thin skin. Crap, I think that's mis, um, uh, a mischaracterization. Anyway, I, yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Um, Ukraine, moreover, would become part of the same political space as Belarus and Russia, and thus strengthen internal opposition to the various regimes. Even, unlike the Soviet Union, Putin's regime has little to offer in terms of a universal progressive political project, and instead, and instead on the menu would be grinding repression, censorship, and mendacity. Even Russia's conservative defense of the international status quo in the form of sovereign internationalism was discredited by the invasion. Russia has decisively moved from being a neo-revisionist power, defending the charter international system against the radicalism of liberal hegemony to becoming an out and out revisionist power. But the thing is that, um, you know, yeah, okay, it's true. Russia is not offering a universalist ideology of uh, a la the Soviet Union that you know that that's the reality but um it is offering something about uh, the sovereignty and about national self-determination because you know you it will say well okay well you basically the uh, the peoples of the Donbass are exercising their national uh, self-determination. Russia does not want to rule over Ukraine. I think Russia just will be happy with a government that is uh, friendly toward Russia or a government that is not like Zelensky, that is willing to work exactly. with Russia. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I think, you know, George, you're absolutely right. I don't I don't know why Russia has to provide a menu to anybody. Right. <laughs> and anyway, um, uh, um, and, and certainly focusing on repression, censorship. And mendacity. I mean, uh, I, we can talk about the West all we want, what it does to its own people. So I think that's really misplaced here. But George is absolutely right. I mean, in the, the, the whatever government is going to be in Kiev and whatever the confines of the borders of Ukraine are, you, you just don't want an arch enemy garrisoning themselves against you. No, that Russia said that's not going to happen. They're going to, and they're doing it. It's not happening, and it won't happen again. Okay. That's right. Um, and then the war transformed Russia and there would be no going back. Uh, Putin's future was doomed, however long he clung onto power. Ultimately, it was clear that in launching such a reckless and brutal war, Russia was fated to suffer a defeat, the like of which it had not seen in a thousand years of its history. This is very strange. I mean, why the, he says this, and I didn't really see what, what he, anything that he had said before would lead one to this the, the scale of this defeat. I mean, unless you're saying that uh, you know NATO will get itself directly involved and America will get itself more directly involved, and that there will be a war between United States and Russia, then I, I don't see why you say the thousand years of its history. I mean, those are them's big words, uh, and uh, and but he didn't say it in that article. That he thought. I mean, it's a possibility. We, as we've said many times before, it may indeed get into a shooting war between Russia and NATO. But he didn't really say it. So to present it in this way, that, that he will suffer a defeat, the like of which not it had not seen in a thousand years of its history, I just just struck me as bizarre. Well, n number one, maybe that was what it took to get it published. <laughs> okay, okay. Number two, and it's something maybe it's worth pondering here. Well, yeah, Russia has exited the liberal world order. Yep, yep, it has. Okay, fine, fine, and 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 the world will go on. <laughs> okay, I mean, I mean, again, this is this this this. We've talked about this with responsible statecraft. There's just such a uh, a wedded addiction to hegemony. Okay, right. so okay, fine. You reject the hegemonic rule of uh, the Atlanticist. Okay, but Russia does that mean Russia ceased to exist? Right. 
That's I mean, it, it, this is a, a very maximalist, uh, open-ended, really weird way to end an article that actually had some very interesting things to no, say. George right. and I disagree with yeah. some of his conclusions, that's but he right. certainly is well-informed. Yeah, that's right. And then he says, many ideas have been advanced to this end, including some sort of indefinite... This is where he talks about, could war have been avoided? Um, it says, and then he says, but... Uh, indefinite moratorium on Ukraine's membership of NATO, some sort of a permanent Finlandization whereby Ukraine retained its domestic autonomy. Um, the Austrian model was also advanced. Um, and then um, the inevitable riposte to these suggestions is that Ukraine should enjoy the right to choose its own alliances and foreign policy. But I don't, I don't, understand i mean all those things that you've listed there finlandization austria neutrality what's wrong with them i mean they, they all seem they, they're a hell of a lot better than what you got now i mean i i you know what what is terrible in what way did austria suffer as a result of the uh the 1955 treaty i think they got a very good deal particularly as austria was on the wrong side of the war as was finland Okay, but uh, Ukraine should enjoy the rights to choose its own uh, alliances and foreign policy. But no, uh, uh, Boris Johnson flying into Kiev saying, no, 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 you don't have a choice. That's right. Yeah, exactly okay? right. You, yeah. We made your choice for yeah. you. So yeah. this is just, this is academic BS, okay? No, yeah. Ukraine is, is was never put on a trajectory of making its own choices. It was put, put on a proje uh, trajectory to make choices made for it. Right. That was the deal. That's you right. do what we say, and we got your back as long as we have your back. And when we don't have your back, we won't have your back. Right. That's right. And, and then says, this, as we have seen, is half the formula enshrined in the Helsinki Final Act. But the other half is the indivisibility of security. All these documents internalize the tension between these two models of post cold War peace orders, the realist and the liberal one. If Cuba's free choice to host Soviet nuclear missiles in 1962 was rightly challenged by the U.S. in October 1962, then why should Ukraine enjoy such a right today? Yeah, you you are co completely correct, sir. It's something we said right at the outset. I remember we were talking along these lines back in February, and and when and was, oh, you know, Ukraine has a right to choose whatever it says. Well. The U.S. didn't say Cuba had a right because, you know, you say, hey, well, Cuba is sovereign. If Cuba wants to host uh, Soviet missiles, why shouldn't it? I mean, it's on its territory. It's sovereign territory. Why shouldn't it? Well, the U.S. did not uh, accept that. And everybody agreed with the U.S. I mean, it's not like somebody, anyone in the Western camp said, well, I think Cuba should uh, should have enjoyed this right. But, oh, well, you know, you know, how dare you tell Ukraine what to do? So... Um, and then it says, in contrast, critics argue that any such compromises would be counterproductive and only feed Russian revanchism. Uh, this no, indeed okay. was the dominant line in Who are the, who are the critics here? Who are the critics here? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, this indeed was the dominant line in Kiev following the 2014 change of regime, and it led to catastrophe. Yeah. Uh, Countercritics are thus in a position to argue that if Putin's Russia was a monstrous beast waiting to pounce, then it would not be unreasonable to manage the animal rather than goading it and expecting the West to bail the country out from the ensuing crisis. Notice what he's done. This is this is about as far as he can go. I mean, you know, he's an academic. You know, he, he wants to hold on to his job, but he kind of he says that you know, well. It really wasn't a very good idea to go down this path um, of goading uh, Russia. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, so. yeah, but I mean, you know, it, it, this 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 Russophobia deceit is oozing everywhere here. You know, Putin's Russia is a monstrous beast. Okay? Well, no, he's saying that if you, critics, you know, it, yeah, it, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, critics, deciding so, the critics, okay, yeah, saying, exactly. you know, I mean, and this is a kind of argumentation we have to deal with, okay? Yes, okay. yeah, yeah, that, but that's not his position. I mean, he's saying, that's not that's his. Not no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and then he says, worse from Moscow's perspective, Ukraine was used by the Atlantic Alliance as a platform to contain Russia. 
Washington and Brussels exploited the inherent and deep-seated Russophobia of the regime that it helped to seize power in 2014. I mean, that, that seems not unreasonable. Um, this would explain why the EU every six months renewed sanctions on Russia for not implementing Minsk, yet placed almost no pressure on Kiev to fulfill its end of the bargain. This is something we talk about now. He, he's saying here something really rather interesting. Given what we've now learned from Hollande, uh, Merkel, Poroshenko, that, not, that they had no intention of fulfilling the Minsk Accords, then the fact that the EU kept imposing sanctions on Russia for failure to implement Minsk when they were doing nothing to implement, they had no intention of ever implementing Minsk. I think that's nothing short of outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then President Barack Obama had refused to send lethal arms to Ukraine for fear of aggravating the situation. And then worse, the Western powers maintained a resolute silence on the forced Ukrainization program, which ran counter to the norms of the EU and NATO espouse. It was not hard for Moscow to imagine that norms did not apply when it came to countering Russia and limiting its influence. No, it definitely wasn't hard. <laughs> don't, 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 are there two authors here? Yeah, they are there. They are. I think they, there are they, two they, authors they, here, yeah. Yeah, it, it, there is because it, he eloquently uh, uh, presents our case over and over again, and then stops yeah. and reverses. I, I'm I'm yeah. really hard to kind of absorb right. this here. Keep going. It, it is that's right. And then um, the inevitable inevitable question then arises: What were Russia's legitimate security interests, and how could they have been reasonably met? If we work with the liberal hegemony paradigm, then Russia's only legitimate option was to accommodate to the overwhelming material and moral power of the West and accept its place as a subaltern. This would have provided huge advantages, including domestic prosperity, external legitimacy, and regional harmony. I don't think that's true at all, incidentally. But I, mean, I don't either. Yeah, I mean... I mean no, but, I, no, but if, if it had been accepted, that, then, then Russia would be implicitly accepting its complete and utter breakup. Right, and it, and it break up and its natural resources, which is you know it, the source of its power. Right? Ah. That would have been robbed. They would have been robbed blind as they were during the ninety. I mean, they would have lost all their natural control over their natural resources. I mean, you really I, think I, I, you know, the, this would have provided huge advantages, including domestic prosperity, external legitimacy, and regional harmony. I, I don't see American foreign policy doing that for anyone. Yeah, regional harmony. Where is this regional harmony? I mean, it's like, I mean that that's not the way the U.S. operates. No, no, no. I mean, what is it? You know, the, you know, you know, Russians they they walk on that side of the street and they have to wear some kind of you know armband. You know, as a second class citizen. Right. I mean, right. Is, that there, yeah. is he saying? I I I I I don't know what external who, who provides this ex legitimacy. I mean, I I don't know. Is, we have to ask for the United States. Can we please have our legitimacy now? Well, you need to do a lot more before we can make you legitimate. But but also the re regional harmony. When does the United States ever pursue a goal of regional harmony? I mean, it's always setting uh, states off against each other. Even in Kazakhstan, I mean, they, they're setting off Kazakhs and Russians against uh, one another. Really? That's what you're going to get? I mean, regional harmony? Yeah, yeah. Nancy Pelosi just flies into Armenia. Yeah, we're going to yeah. have regional harmony. That's okay. it. Yeah, exactly. On yeah, the back we, of her trip that's right. We're, we're, we're with the Armenians. Harmony. That's it. We're with the Armenians. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, this was the option taken by post-war Germany and Japan, and their success stands as testimony to the efficacy. That, that was coercion and occupation. Excuse me, everyone. That was occupation, coercion. The U.S. determined what kind of democratic institutions and elections, even parties. OK, so don't give me this. OK, right. that was the option taken by. No, Germany and Japan did not have options. OK, <laughs> none. Unconditional surrender. I mean, this is, you know, that that's that's a big deal. This wasn't even, you know, defeat a la Napoleon. This was unconditional surrender. In other words, we we don't have a right to demand anything. You know, you 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 set all policies, and that that's what Germany and Japan got. So, um, the only problem was that post-communist Russia did not consider itself a defeated power. No, that 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 uh, because it wasn't a defeated power. I mean, for whatever reasons. 
the leaders decided to liquidate communism and the Soviet Union. I mean, you know, we can talk about that, and we have many times, but nonetheless, it wasn't because they couldn't compete with the West. They could compete with, and they could have easily gone on competing uh, with the West. I mean, you know, it was, I mean, they were they, they were the e militarily they were the equals um, of the uh, of the United States, and they could have gone on had they wanted to. They could have gone on fighting the Cold War. That was so. There was no defeat. Um, and then um, uh, the only problem, yeah, that, that's, that's right. So then that, that is why Boris Yeltsin and Putin pursued the realist sovereign internationalist path, generating conflicts with the collective West. Th that generated, I mean, kind of vice versa, no? Um, yeah, <laughs> there's a causality problem here. That's okay. right. Uh, this option did not necessarily entail a regional sphere of influence, but it certainly meant a sphere of security. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he says, um, and this is now is finally coming to his conclusion. It also ultimately entailed attempts to create alternative regional instruments of integration. Uh, and then he lists, you know, the Euro Eurasian Economic Union, Collective Security Treaty Organization, the Western equivalents, EU and NATO, studiously refused any sustained official content with the two, contact with the two, exposing the logic of hegemony beneath the veneer of normative idealism. Okay. Yeah. There could yeah. be no alternative to liberal hegemony, and attempts to construct one were met with the full force of Atlantic power, drawing on its 500 year history of imperialism. Right? Uh, yeah. That is why Russian thinkers such as Sergei Karaganov are wrong to argue that the era of Western predominance is over. The war in Ukraine with all its endless human tragedy proves otherwise, although this will be at best a pyrrhic victory. Russia's rebellion against the Western hegemony would be crushed and following the inevitable defeat, it will be ready to join the ranks of a sub as a subaltern of liberal hegemony. This for many is no bad things and will allow the country at last fully to decommunize, demilitarize, and lose its exaggerated great power ambitions, Russia would finally be set on the path of peace, prosperity, freedom, or so liberals believe. I, I have to say, I'm, I was baffled by this last paragraph, because I, I'm, I'm not sure here, well, what, first of all, what he's saying. I mean, is, is he saying this is the way it's going to be, or is this the way that the leaders of the Western liberal hegemony uh, think that it'll uh, uh, there'll be an outcome because or is it I, something I, he wants or is it something that's he right wants? exactly is he speaking for himself or is he speaking on behalf of the uh, the Western liberal hegemon I mean well, it's I mean, it, it very I mean, very strange uh, I, last I think it, he, uh, it would have been better maybe for him because it's there's a question here if this is his opinion he could have entered it or so liberals believe be careful what you hope for then it would kind of you know put a kind of a different spin on it here um i, I he argued but I mean, but our see, what makes this difficult is what, because then he says well that's why this guy rush sergey karaganov is wrong well when he says that then he sounds like he's now speaking for himself and that's why you think oh he's obviously think now saying uh that's my view because otherwise you know why bring in this this guy sergey karaganov is wrong to argue that the area of western predominance is over and then he says, well, this will be a Pyrrhic victory. So, so I mean, so what's he saying? He's saying that Russia will win and that this will be a Pyrrhic victory? I mean, I, I, I couldn't understand. Who, who would have a Pyrrhic victory? Who would have the Pyrrhic victory? It's very, very unclear here. It goes all the way back to the title, which is very unclear whose folly is being right. committed. It's very odd to end such a very long, meticulous ar article on these notes here because they seem to be very erratic. OK, but Russia's rebellion against Western hegemony would be crushed in the following would inevitable defeat. Well, what does de defeat mean? And and so it will be a subaltern um, subject that will join the ranks of the liberal hegemony. But the OK, the, the very name, this is all about Russia's security. It's not joining a club or, or abstaining from a club. Right. It is about existence. It's existential. Right, right. But and, that, and, but, and, yeah. Yeah. Well, but then again, when he talks about Russia's rebellion against Western hegemony would be crushed. 
Um, I mean, again, I mean, is he saying that it will be crushed by Western hegemony? Then again, he's kind of you're, you're jumping ahead. I mean, you know, I mean that may happen, but you, you, there's the several steps along the way before that happens. I mean, there's no no evidence so far that Russia is being crushed by a Western hegemony. I mean, you know, its economy is is not doing badly. You know, it's got allies in the world. I mean, yeah, eventually may, they may be crushed, but for him to just throw this out there that it would be uh, that it will be crushed, and that it's an inevitable defeat. Um, where's that coming from? You know, well, I mean, it, it, considering he's talking about guerrilla warfare, you know, endlessly in Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, Russia's rebellion against Western hegemony would be crushed. Is, is that occupation? Uh, occupation of the country. I mean, he's already talked about this defeat. Russia will experience a defeat, the likes of which it hasn't in a thousand years. Um, that's that's pretty strong words. Remember, he's saying it's much worse than the defeat they suffered in World War One. I. I mean, that was a pretty spectacular uh, defeat. So he's saying this is going to be even worse, obviously, than what they suffered in World War One. So, I. Mean, also, I mean, we could go through this sentence for uh, almost endlessly here. Um, um, okay, Russia's rebellion against uh, Western hegemony is that um, will that uh, be come about because of military defeat? It's it's not that's right. It's not good. He said because it, the previous sentence is this: the Sergei Karaganov is wrong to argue that the era of Western predominance is over. So that sounds like a predominance means cultural and economic predominance. So now he says, and since that leads on to the inevitable defeat, he's saying that you know not no one can challenge the West culturally and economically, which again, I mean, if you want to argue that, then that, that's a whole separate article. Um, but, you know, as we've had Michael Hudson here um, and he doesn't think that that's the case. Um, he actually thinks that it's the other way that the Russian Chinese model of kind of state capitalism and, and so on is it will prevail over the uh, financial capitalism of the West. Again, Hudson may not be right, but you know, but to say that this is inevitable just seems very strange. Well, also, I mean, let, let's not be naive here. I mean, George, predominant hegemonic powers have come and gone through history. Okay, I mean, wh why the West under uh, under its current ideology is an exception is a mystery to me. Okay, great civilizations like this, they they they. They don't, they're very rarely destroyed from the outside. They're destroyed within, okay, through yeah. corrupt hierarchies, uh, corrupt elites, um, and, and, and lo last, uh, uh, loss of faith uh, yeah. in themselves, okay? Right. And I personally think that is what's going on right now. And I don't particularly lament it because, and I get this all the time, you know, Peter, you're so anti-Western. I said, no, a, it's really interesting to me if you look at the emerging world, the the um, the, uh, uh, the global majority, they have actually adopted many ideas of the Enlightenment. Not every single one of them, and not in the same way that we would understand or even agree. But there is a there is a rough consensus. There's a lot of good ideas out there, and but it's not one size fits all because it isn't universalistic. But the West is taking those what it claims to be universal um, elements and they're crushing them, freedom of speech, um, a rule of law, all these other kinds of things. OK, so, I mean, I'm not in its current iteration. Do I lament the end of this five year, 500 year um, um, experience? Not particularly because things move on. Well, that's right. And, and the problem that um, uh, the West is having is that you know it's one thing to keep espousing these values but if you don't live up to them and you patently don't live up to them um then you know then then you have no business you know espousing those values so if we say well we you know we believe in the rule of law you know people say well you don't but you don't you, you have people um in prison for years and years without even having been charged with anything i mean you know I mean, we Julian, can start, Assange. Start, Julian Assange, you know, we can talk Get about, the, yeah, the, all, the, all the people in, um, uh, you know, with the, 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 the riot in uh, two years ago, uh, and so on. So, you know, and, and then, of course, when you treat, uh, you know, where we're freedom of the press, well, what kind of freedom of the press is it? 
you close down RT. What 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 has RT done? What what you know what crimes has, has RT done other than it's a media outlet that you don't like? And even if it's a government uh, owned media outlet, that still doesn't give you a, a right to close it down. It's still a media outlet, and according to Most... all the treaties and everything else, it's it's you can't start differentiating between government and non government uh, media outlets. If you if you if, if looking at global media, if you um, w with the exception of the Anglo-Saxon world, which what makes up two percent of the world's population, most major media uh, outlets have are government funded, government controlled. There's some kind of state involvement. Right. The West is the exception. The rest of the world is the rule. But even in the West, I mean, it's it's not an exception. I mean, we have the BBC uh, is a government uh, media outlet. NPR. Uh, you know, you got NPR, then you've got uh, in in France. I mean, you've got, uh, and then again in Germany, you have Deutsche Welle. I mean, you can go through it. So even in in the Western world, you have government uh, owned media outlets. So well, I, I, I said Anglo-Saxon world because it's a bit more specific there. But you're right. You're but that's it. But that yeah, Al, but Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera. But the BBC, the, the BBC is you know probably uh, Britain's most famous uh, media outlet, and that is government own now so so that doesn't give you any right to um uh to close down uh you know well you have the right obviously to close down uh rt and sputnik and so on but you are in violation of all again all of those solemn treaties that you're always so proud of you know which where it says quite clearly that you're not going to uh well, yeah. crush uh but, but, free going, media and freedom of speech going, Going back to this article, I, you know, it, it, again, it's kind of a mishmash of a lot of things. I had totally expected something totally different because I know this scholar's work. Um, but I mean, you know, as we draw to the end of this article, is what he's presenting, even if it's not his personal opinion, is are the conclusions of this article a good idea? I mean, it, it's left kind of open ended. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's left. Um very abruptly because this is the last um paragraph and uh and then he, he's kind of starts off saying yeah okay well the, the western equivalents you know they haven't cooperated with um the alternative institutions um and uh and then he seems to say well therefore the western um uh is bound to win and and then you go well why is the west bound to win i mean the <laughs> I mean, there's just there's nothing here to suggest the West is bound to win. I mean, it may win. I mean, that may well happen. But for him to say, well, OK, tough luck. You know, the West refused to cooperate with you. You lost. Um, and that, you know, that that's that. So how, how does he know? How does he know ahead of time that uh, that, that, that that the West is bound to win this? And that's why well, it's, they, it's a very strange uh conclusion but you say yeah the western liberal hege hegemonic model will obviously prevail yeah but what's, what's interesting here and i guess maybe this is really the real tension in this article because i'm looking straight at my uh, at the paragraph here and my I, my eyes keep being drawn to these two words which we very rarely actually see put together atlantic power right. atlantic power but what makes the this article very difficult turgid actually is that you're you on the one hand you're talking about a set of values and then you're talking about power okay right. and that's that's all that's part of this neoliberal agenda is to always mask raw power with good feeling ideas right. liberalism right. okay that's and, and that's the trick their linguistic little trick here but it really what it gets down to is will atlantic power prevail well that's it i mean the atlantic power and then and then you wonder, well, he seems to say that he will prevail. Then you think, well, why does he think it will prevail? And then you ask, is he suggesting, and that goes together with that earlier statement, that Russia will suffer a defeat, the likes of which it has not suffered in a thousand years. He seems to be suggesting that there will be a full-scale war between Russia and NATO. That's that's the only thing I can think of because it, it otherwise I don't quite see um, why you he's he's going to say well you know there's the full force of Atlantic power 
uh, and that they will prevail and Russia will, uh, you know, will just have to take its uh, its place as an insignificant little cog. Uh, so, so it, it, well, then using your line of interpretation of this article, so the West gets off scot-free? I mean, Russia is completely destroyed, and then we you know we we go. But that's what that's, that's the implication. Sunset. Yeah, Russia. The, that's you know, that's really bizarre. That that's the implication. Yeah, the West gets off uh, scot free. So um, yeah, um, I, I I don't I don't I don't know. But it it's a it's an interesting article. Um, uh, as I think you said, there are kind of two two authors here, um, either battling it out or you know or he's. Obviously, he's got an audience in mind. He wants to maintain his academic respectability. And above all, he wants to keep his job because, um, you know, in the United Kingdom, there is no such thing anymore as academic tenure. Um, every academic is liable to be fired. And given the hysteria uh, in the UK about Russia, uh, there will, you know, there'll be all sorts of readers trying to sniff out a secret agent of Putin's uh, in his work. So you can see why he might be very wary of uh, g going out on a limb here. But, but I think that's that's kind of where, why there is well, this strange tension. Yeah, there's kind of like two paragraphs. Is that, is, read this paragraph. I, I said it. I said it. You know, the end of Russia, you know, uh, uh, Atlantic power. Right. Okay. Right. It, it, that seems like covering a base to me. Right. Hey, look, I, I don't want to insult uh, Sakwa at all, because I think he's a very interesting thinker, and I will continue to read his stuff. I was very perplexed with his article. I thought it was very well uh, sourced and resourced, okay, and, and a lot of really um, uh, solid thinking. George and I nodded as George was reading it, um, but then there are other parts that don't seem to fit. It's in, in my opinion, it was like squaring a circle somehow, and right. I it didn't work for me, at least. Right. No, I, I, I think so, and I think that um, his conclusion seems abrupt and there was nothing really you know that that was leading up to this uh, very dramatic conclusion so if you are going to conclude that the west will win and russia will be crushed and you bring up atlantic power then you have to then say well what what is it that is going to crush it and if and i i still think that the suggestion is that it's going to be a, a shooting war between nato and russia then, uh, then you you, know, you have to then say, well, you know, you <laughs> say, so why, why would the, you know, what, what, what is the basis for the West to do this? And then you can say, well, the West gets off scot free. You mean it starts a shooting war that it, it provoked this war, and then, and then it, you know, then you know, threatens, uh, you know, maybe nuclear annihilation, uh, and then you say, hey, we won. You know the West. Uh, the West uh, is a predominant liberal values. Liberal hegemony uh, will go on for another five hundred years. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't seem very satisfying. Well, it's not very scholarly. Sorry, I mean it's not empirically yeah. founded and, and yeah. based. Okay. In, in, in comparison to the rest of the article yeah. that was very well thought out, uh, well researched, and well written. Okay, which is. Very rare that those three things are always uh, they come together. Okay, right. Right. no insult to the gentleman, but um, uh, it, it's look. George and I have been uh, talking about this for almost two hours. It was worth the effort. We did it for you guys, all yeah. right? Um, because there's sometimes it comes into the literature. There is something worth discussing, even if George and I are not on board. As a matter of fact, it's yeah. a very good exercise for us yeah. to to you know ground our ideas and understand yes. where we're coming from. I like I like the challenge, and you should too. Yeah. You have to be challenged. Just don't passively accept it. Don't yeah. passively accept George and I. Okay. That's right. No, that's right. No, All right, that's everybody. Right. This has been a long one. I got to take my dogs out here. <laughs> this is The Gaggle. This is Peter and George. We're on Locals. So please go to thegaggle.locals.com. I know, buddy. I know. Um, uh, please go visit our store. And tomorrow is the first of this week's live streams with George. Exactly. So tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern time, uh, live stream on Locals. And you know, finally, the wait is over. Uh, please come with questions, comments, criticisms, and think about little Buddy because uh, Buddy's been sitting there patiently waiting, and he said, like, I, I'm, "I'm getting sick of this guy." Uh, you, know, you know, you know, anything as lo long-winded like that. So, um, you know, we don't want Buddy in a in a bad mood. So, if you have a few bob in your pocket, whip him out, dunk him in his tip jar, and that'll at least cure his uh, restlessness. 
uh, we're very grateful for all of your help and friendship and support. The more you're able to donate, the more of these videos we can make, uh, the more we can invest in much improved technology, and above all, the more we can keep uh, Buddy on board because he's getting to be quite frustrating. <laughs> so remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.